Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Coffee Club podcast, episode 85. We're going to get into it, but first, we just came off an amazing uh, interview with Craig Marchand, so we're still got jitters buzzing uh that's gonna come life-changing it was (laughs) yeah we don't even know how to like do this anymore just be act normal because it was the most inspiring thing ever it's gonna go we're gonna do a little recap of the track fest the meet we were just at in la and then we'll slot it in there but uh you guys are gonna love it it was seriously listening to him talk all his experiences i i don't think i really before i took the time to think about how amazing he is he was for so long and yeah, just all the things he achieved and all the experiences that he had and the fact that he's a coach now, he obviously is taking that all and putting it into his coaching. And so here, he's an amazing talker. So listening to it was very special. So that'll come in about 20 minutes or so. So it's one that's one that will want you make you get out and go running. Yeah, probably give you goosebumps. If you're if you're listening to it on the run, you're probably going to start running. You can crush very quickly yeah. and just feel really good. So, <laughs> get ready for that. But first off, we have a little bean shout out. This comes from shit, I'm blanking on the name right now. Reina? Yeah, Reina. Very Crushed well it. Done. Very well done. She came up to me at the LA meet and handed me this lovely bag of beans. It has a beautiful dog on it. Not a bulldog, but very very cool nonetheless these beans are from santa monica from good boy bob good boy bob coffee roasters and we're very excited to try them so perfect and we also want to give a shout out to derek rubis uh he's been uh, a big fan of ours for a long time and he did finally get the oec tattoo so super fan status super fan status that's huge (laughs) but not wasting any time getting into the meet i think you would have seen on our socials we're in la for the let me get this right on Track Nights LA Track Fest. Sound running. Presented by Sound Running. Presented by Sound Running. <laughs> and it was a cool trip. Coming off Philly last week, we were a little bit tired. That was a longer trip. And you're in the city, so you don't really get much time to relax or anything. So I think for all of us, going to California, it was pretty nice weather. We are, so we got five days of rain in Philly to like <laughs> four days of pretty beautiful sunshine in LA. Yeah. It was a nice change. And we had a big Airbnb just kind of in a more chill suburb area. So it was very nice and relaxing. And uh, there was a lot of anticipation for this one. It was, I think, you know, the LA Sound Running Meets, high quality. And we had people in a lot of events ready to go. And then there was also just all this excitement around it for us. Perhaps you already saw, we had the red carpet. Uh, we had a big concert at the end of the the meet or not at the end sorry 10k runners before the 10k runners and we also had the ceo there which i don't know if anyone guessed it i don't think anyone did when we when we said last episode that gus was away on a business trip but uh he was getting driven down there by mr andy weeding big thank you to him Big thank you to andy so gus was there in person which i know made a lot of people's day so it was really cool, but we're going to get into it. Um, first off, starting with George, who this was, we'd been kind of leading up to this for a few weeks, ever since your first people, that this one was going to be kind of the big test. The last one was dipping your toes in. This one was jumping in and seeing how, how the water treats you. How the water treats you. And <laughs> boy, did he swim. Boy, did he swim. So, yeah, it was... Off, off to you, George. Yeah. <laughs> Recap your own race, for, please. <laughs> yeah. Tell us no, how that's, a, that's a pretty good summary, I think. Um, it was always going to take kind of two um, like the first one was always just going to be a bit of a write off but like something we felt like we needed to do before getting in one with some actual with some kind of top top level steeplers and uh, like it always felt like kind of running in the 820s was, was kind of the benchmark and like I don't think I was ever an 8 40 steeple out and i hope it, no one actually thought that i and i'm glad to think to know that that was true like mm-hmm. i said like the first one wasn't definitely wasn't a fitness test by any means and it was nice to to confirm that by by running just a, a big pr a fat pr, <laughs> fat PR <laughs> as a professional runner you don't have it too often when you run a 20 second <laughs> it's, like like well. <laughs> yeah. it's a good feeling um, so yeah, definitely a bit more excited for this one. Like it was nice having the whole team on a trip again. Um, yeah, just big on me, rocked up in um, some freaking fits. You probably saw on Instagram, looking good. Um, <laughs> I had like 
I think I had legit five minutes to yeah, change. By little, the time it was, I got it was a little this, rushed. I didn't get to wear mine for very long. Uh, but yeah, got into jumped in the deep end. They unfortunately turned off the lights for only my race. <clears throat> not, not important enough, I guess. So that was a bit of a bummer because I honestly think like there was there was a chance for some people to run the standard in that. Yeah, like, set the lights at eight fifteen. Yeah, that's what they told us on the line. They said the lights are running at the stand like let's go get some Wait, standards they told you that and then they weren't the guy on. who started the race like 30 seconds before oh, was like we've I got the lights you knew that they weren't going to be on no i thought we just because we went out in like 64 i was like oh they might just they must just be right behind us yeah. at 66 yeah and then wow they just never they That's, never came they, by they, they malfunctioned <laughs> who knows maybe they have to do them different for the steeple and they hadn't accounted for that but the woman's steeple was before us oh they and were they on lights. for the women's yeah. steeple that sucks. I'm pretty sure. So more complaining about the lights. Yeah, classic. Like um, Must have to activate it next time. Yeah. But just cool to be in it with um, Hillary and Bernard and um, Joey, who's kind of been helping with a little bit of stuff in Boulder, and it was definitely a lot more enjoyable than the first one. First one didn't have a great time, gonna yeah. be honest, um, and didn't make me super pumped to run another one, but kind of felt like i had to give it a proper chance and i'm glad i did yeah and yeah i mean i honestly still think that it was like it wasn't a true like a fitness test it still felt like more like a test of the barriers Mm -hmm. and the water jump like it wasn't like the last two laps of a hard mile or a hard 5k like they hurt they hurt like shit yeah whereas I was I was still pretty comfortable the last couple of laps. Like I was still just trying to run barriers and stay smooth and um shout out to BYU dude. Kenneth running away with it. Um That's a, that's a good name for BYU guy. Kenneth. Mm-hmm. I do like the name Kenneth. 817 is crazy. Yeah, that's legit. Not a joke, a collegiate athlete I wonder too. what the collegiate record is. Well, uh, the oh, crazy, it's something crazy I from like Henry Rona. Rona. But, but the, yeah, I think that was number 6 only. I was looking at it, I'm like Oh, dude, they run crazy steeple in the NCAA. Mm. Very impressive. Yeah. But, uh, so, would have liked to win, obviously. But, definitely, hey, a couple of... the inside somehow. Snuck through for... Snuck through on the inside again. For a big second place, <laughs> big taking second some place. scalps. Yeah, big yeah. scalps. Really cool. 820. Pretty legit. Yeah. Yeah. He's uh, the reigning US champ, correct? The last, yeah, the last couple of US champs, I think. So, yeah. Great bloke, too. Um, yeah. Yeah, super nice guy. They also... Um, no, not a, not an excuse, but they also just a classic uh, lap counter oh, the, era. The bell lap, <laughs> Bring, ringing the bell, the bell twice. Did you realize that when they rang me the first time that it was wrong? Did you know straight away? By that point, I knew. The lap before, I didn't know okay. because the like the counter was wrong as well. Oh, oh yeah. So when we came by and it, we had three to go, and I saw two, I was like, "Holy shit! I'm I home. feel so good." <laughs> you know that actually <laughs> might be better for you though, if and I then, think about it. And then I like Mentally, made yeah. I made kind of like a hard move. I'm pretty sure I got into like Pretty second. Helped. I made got into like second place briefly, and then I started doing some maths. I was like, all right, so we we're gonna run like seven fifteen. Sweet. <laughs> I was like, wait, fuck, that doesn't that doesn't sound right. I don't think we're gonna do that. And then I don't know. I got distracted and like lost a bunch of places again. But uh, so then by the time I got back round, I'd figured out that we actually did still have two more to go. You knew that that made the mistake. Um, which is yeah, annoying. Made some good progress on the water jump, I felt like. Body's definitely in a better spot than it was after the first one. Yeah, the next day you were pretty good. Yeah, I was feeling pretty fresh still. So that's nice. And But I still think there's like a couple of seconds over the water jump, a couple of seconds over the barriers in general. Like I'm, I'm hoping that was kind of good enough to, to get into another one. And like I, I think I can... I think I can run under eight ten in the next few months. Oh, like yeah. I don't see any reason why not, just based on how that one felt. Damn. I was hoping seven forty five. I thought you were, thought you were going to say seven forty five. Maybe seven fifteen. I guess I'll take. True. I guess I'll take. Uh, I'll take under eight ten. Yeah, so, so eight ten yeah. would be a good place to start. And then yeah, yeah. So I was they, telling um, Chris Chavez afterwards in the interview. I was like, kind of part of the reason. Well, like I didn't enjoy the first one so much, and then like I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around this one a bit. I said, normally I'm just like, <clears throat> I just race for the last like 200. That's like, that's what gets me fired up. Like 
that's kind of what I love about the competition side of it at the moment. And so the steeple was like part of it for me right now is trying to find something to get it can't just to be get the last excited 50, about. It can't be the last fifty meters after that last. <laughs> yeah. that, that last I, think, I think I think the last lap is just exciting because it's like one more time. I know, and, and I think also that last water jump is always yeah. massive. So I think Huge. I need to like, and I'm I'm starting to think that a little bit. So if I can like get get excited about the last lap in the steeple is equally as much, then then I think I'm gonna enjoy it a lot more. Yeah, let's get George excited. I think we might have I think maybe, we might have, we might, have, we might have broken through here. Might have found his event. I don't know. Yeah, Stay tuned. Stay if tuned. I can figure out how to just <laughs> like full, full sprint the last water jump and just like clear it or something, yeah. you like, just, that'd be sick. I sh- dude, that would be. I think for you, it's especially in a race where you're feeling good. This might be hard if you're like on eight minute pace and you're like hanging on. Hang on. Yeah. But if you're feeling good mentally, if you know you're going to just send it on the last water jump and not touch it, like full jump it. That might be the move, like to give you that momentum for like to really just destroy that last 200 of the race. Someone was telling me that Ezekiel Kimboy used to do that yeah. on the last lap. Just hurdle the barrier and the pit on no, the last lap. No, they, they used to do it. and Just full send. It's very impressive to witness. I don't know how they, they like the canyons, they're, the way they jump over those hurdles is simultaneously so efficient and so inefficient <laughs> which, it's a fucking, it's which a, seems not possible they've made it's something really off. inefficient efficient somehow they look so smooth so off. easy yeah. but their hurdle form is just so different from oh. what you would conventionally teach someone as to the correct way to hurdle mm-hmm. but that was uh, a steeple that's a steeple uh, it was pretty freaking sweet to be out there for it was awesome to watch yeah, yeah I, I definitely Felt the most nerves for your race, George. Purely off the fact that Steeple is like the one race where a lot can go right and a lot can go wrong. So Anything we had also happen. just watched the Doha Steeple, which was that bit, probably didn't help. Bit of carnage. <laughs> that didn't help. Um, but it also, like, I mean, as a teammate and as a as a close friend of yours, you know, you you want you want it so bad for you, for, for you. You know, you want you want it, but like you can't do anything. You have to sit there and you just have to wait and see how it goes. And, Obviously, I, Morgan and I talked about when we were at Penn and how you get more nervous just not being in control of those sort of things. But uh, being able to sit there and, and just watch you uh, crush was uh, was really, really, really fun. And um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I can't wait for the next one. Me too. Uh, apart from the steeple, Ollie, what was your favorite event of the night? <sighs> um, well, for me personally, it was the 800. Um, purely for the fact that I actually got <laughs> pulled into an interview afterwards. I put in a lot of hype on this 800. I really thought my You were boys, the main salesman for the 800. Yeah, I thought my boys could run 145. And Mario would, would tell you that he could run 145 as well as Yard. Um, but, I mean, conditions, it was a bit cold. And I think for them also going straight into an 800 with 800 guys, you know, you just, you just never know how things are going to go down. for the 815, it was both of them were a few seconds slower. Yeah. Than what they probably wanted. Um, but yeah. it's great racing either way. Um, Yard... Just, yeah, I, there's yeah, not okay. much to say. In the post, so for those who didn't watch, Yard won uh, 146. Two. Two, and then Mario was fourth, 146 high, I think. Yeah. And in the post-race interview, Yard said, I couldn't go any faster. That was a lie. He, went he was sandbagging it. Yeah. He saved up for a massive sprint in the last 100. <laughs> I was like, I called him out after. I was like, Yard, what do you mean you can't go any faster? I saw you two days ago. Run a 400 in 49 seconds. I know you can do it. He was sandbagging it. Um, and we're now in like 53, didn't he? Something like that. Yeah. I, th- I think Yard I think Yard doesn't really care about time. He wants to win, right? So he, he focuses on what he knows how to win best, which is closing the fuck out of that last 200 meters, which is what he does beautifully. Um, and he won that race. But there was a point where I did, t- I did chat to him after it, uh, after we spoke to Chiki Chavez and, and Kyle Membrane. Kyle um, <laughs> Membrane. <laughs> That was close. <laughs> um, but, I mean, Sidious, they set us down and uh, it was cool to go through the race. I really like what they did there. They go through the race and they talked to about how Yared was feeling with it all and, and everything. But after we left and we kind of chatted about it, I was like, like the hundred, last 100 meters, is like, Yared goes, that's my full sprint. I can't go any quicker. Like, that's his full sprint. And watching him and, and I, I did kind of say to him, I said, hey, mate, like when I was told running fast at the end, try and relax your face. It usually relaxes the rest of your body and you can kind of like, go through he said i really tried doing that didn't work it's just like this like one of this squinched face and just teeth teeth showing and 
grinning and um but you know it worked. Said, don't don't change anything you're winning races you're crushing it so um i think I like my, that was that was your advice well that, okay, what, what other advice i'm gonna get i was just telling him i was like usually i relax my face and i feel like i can go quicker so i was like if you i've never got, heard that before i'm gonna try that if you like watch a lot of the runners like the sprinters don't really have a like this face they kind of a relaxed face sprinters so are relaxed Andrew Murphy was that's because sprinters that. only have to try hard for like but if your body seconds. is relaxed upper if your upper body is relaxed you actually can i feel like go quicker. well it's true but i and, think it depends on your face depends can. on the person because as then, you said it's work it's working really well for yarrow that's what but, but yarrow said that he might have a bit bit of you know like something extra. something extra and i was like well if you do maybe what's causing you not to get that little extra boost is maybe <laughs> too tense i think it's wise but he looked incredible and i think mario um did amazing as well i think he was a bit too far back yeah i think he could have yeah and i think he f- finished thinking like damn i was too far back this is, this is my thing is yarad raced it exactly like you expect a 1500 meter to race an 800 yeah whereas mario also did that but i think mario could race an 800 more like an 800 runner yeah. and mm-hmm. put himself out there and I go agree. for more of a positive split type um, scenario i, I can't miss- believe that yarad hasn't lost a race since usa's yeah. he's eight for eight on the track eight in a row pretty amazing got to put him on the start lane with Jakob yeah he's ready to go yeah. eight um, professional wins how many people have eight professional wins Jakob, in their career not many not Jakob, many that's it. See, and he's not he's doing like I think he's going and doing all the races he's I not the like, most I have is like three or four he's yeah because I, when I, when I the streak is alive but he's got a streak going and we should keep it going uh, Bryce Hopple is another guy that had a lot of professional races won in the 800 remember mm-hmm. he had that huge streak mm-hmm. yeah I think that was that was college it was like twenty eight hundred. That was, oh, that was college. college. Yeah, that was it's still college. impressive. It was, it was amazing. Still impressive. But yeah. um, you're right. It was college. Uh, I missed the fifteen hundred meter women's race. I got to see a recap of it. But Morgan, what do you? Uh, what did yeah. you take away from that one? I mean, just to be honest, I just get incredibly nervous <laughs> watching watching Cinta race now. I'm so yeah. invested. Yeah. But uh, our women raced really well. It was, it was, it was like they went out good the first four hundred, and then. At some point, it ended up slowing down a bit, and the pacemaker got a little bit away. It was a it was a really solid field, and just it was it was a really good race. I think Sage she went to the front at one point in with in the second last lap, I believe, and she kind of controlled it from there. Santa was kind of just off her a little bit, maybe just a tiny bit too far back. But really, they both raced really well, uh, first and fourth again, running I think four or six, four or seven, or maybe I think it was one second part which yeah on with the conditions because it it was weird Cal, this is classic california it gets really cold just suddenly at one point when it's a bit windy too yeah and a little a little bit before the wind dies down somehow yeah. Yeah. it got cold yeah. so it was just cold and windy and then four races in a row yeah. were just like slightly slower than you would have expected yeah because it was the same in the men's both 800s both 1500s yeah. so they just like they they both raced really solid stage and center and i think they fit, will feel pretty good. Like looking back on it now, taking it forward is just as another good kind of check in of the form. Still relatively early season, so yeah, they were like Cinta was disappointed after it because she's a competitor and so she wants to win every race she does as she should. So at the time she's a little disappointed, but I think now they're both looking back on it, they're pretty happy. Uh, I'm not sure what the next race is for Sage. Is she is it Diamond League? I think it might be Rabat. She's going to Rabat. She's yeah. going to finally race an 800? Is Rabat an 800? Shit. Must be. Must be. She's done the 600 to 1500. Mm-hmm. She's done the K. The K. <laughs> the mile. <laughs> she's <laughs> running every <laughs> event except she's dodged, her event. She's dodged every event except for her own. She's, yeah. so, she's training around it. Yeah. So that would be good to see. I think both of them, yeah, in gray spots. And then the kind of the... This was like a massive performance for Josette, the women's 5K. This was the one which was a bit up in the air because of the pacing situation. Uh, but the conditions for this were actually pretty good. Yeah, like this is the, the, the 5K is the event where if it's a little bit colder. You're like, oh, that's pretty good. I'm going to get pretty hot at, at some yeah. point in this race. And uh, I think I was, I didn't actually get to see this much of it because I was helping out with some stuff, but Josette crushed it. Yeah, I think uh, there was a bit of pacing from Danny Jones didn't pace. Uh, she was planning to, and then I think she had some sort of. She, or uh, she, she, she was like, I think thrown up after the eight hundred. Yeah, she was sick or something. Something happened. So she she just, I think there. it was just like post eight hundred. Yeah, so she's just, she just feeling the eight hundred, and then we had. Um, it was the BYU girl. BYU girl. Not. Well, I thought that CU I think that CU girl. There was a pace, pace in there. Michaela. Oh, Michaela. Michaela did pace a mile. Yeah. 
think I was talking about Kulin. I think Josette was leading the majority she, of the race and then just kind of squeezed it down. Um, apparently her last mile away. was 4.30 something. Yeah. Well, yeah. Whitney did some pacing as well. Yeah. yeah. It was it was a really imp- uh, Whitney did do some pacing yeah because yeah. uh, Dathan went up to uh, the coach. What's who are you coach? Did you? Did you? Uh, I I thought of a name for her <laughs> with my name stuff, but I don't know if it's a good one. All right, we'll we'll talk about it after and then we'll yeah. bring it back later. It, it's to do with mustard. Whoa. <laughs> Dijon, that's not bad. That's not Dijon. <laughs> yeah, that's not bad. I don't, I don't know if that works though. We'll we'll, we'll, uh, we'll put it's that. A soft, this is a soft launch. Yeah, we'll we'll put that in the soft launch. Um, we'll maybe, maybe activate it, maybe punt it to another timeline. Um, but in general, she had a bit of help with the pacing, and then she kind of just took control of the race and just like ran away with it. Really impressive run. Um, yeah, quick close. Yeah, very quick close. She's obviously really fit. She ran an amazing mile at Milrose, and um, she won the 1500. At Penn, so she's uh, she's crushing it. I don't know when her next race is. I think she's in the Diamond League there, maybe depending on. Yeah, she's into she'll stuff. be heading over to Europe and trying to do. It's gonna be interesting to see it. what she runs at USA. Mm. I, it, I mean, I'm guessing. I think. Do we know if Alicia's gonna double? She's definitely gonna ten k. I think we asked her on the when we had her on the show last time. I think she did. She answer it. I can't remember. I think she did. I've since forgotten. But yeah. I think she wants to double if she can. But I think Joe's confirmed that he's doubling. Joe's that's a different story. Where she, uh, the fifteen hundred and the five k double, I think is a little bit of a different story compared to the five k ten k double. And Dathan in the post race interview said that that performance made it even harder. Which I mm. I suppose makes sense if you've been doing well in the fifteen hundred. And then you went and ran a really shit 5K, but uh, I'm doing a 1500. <laughs> <Make> <laughs> but if you sense. also crushed the 5K, it's like, oh, yeah. what are we going to do? So yeah. it'll be very, if you're correct, it's going to be so interesting because very she can be very successful in both those events. Well, yeah, that would be really hard as a coach and as Josette to kind of pick it because the US team is hard to make regardless of what event you do, right? So um, yeah, that would be really interesting. Yeah, I would probably pick the... I'd pick the 5K. I'd pick the 1500. I'd pick the 5K. I think the 5K two is... 15 too. I think if, if you're also having a teammate in that event, if Alicia does double, the two of them working together to run away with it, I think... Yeah. Could potentially happen. I don't know. I'm just thinking about meddling at Worlds and I think the 1500, you have... I feel like the 1500 is pretty hard. I mean, they're both pretty hard. They're both extremely hard. I think if you make I mean, it you through the rounds of the 1500, on. like you have... Yeah, you're right. They're both incredibly hard. I mean, yeah, like Faith and Laura Mueller and like a few other ladies. I mean, the Aussie girls are doing great. Like there's so many good people in the 1500. There's so many good people in the 5K. It's just the way the sport is now. Yeah. Everyone's just amazing. Yeah. Good job, everyone. Good job, everyone. Well Keep it up. Keep but it up. yeah, so that was the OAC roundup. Mm-hmm. The rest of us, which was just Gus, Ollie, myself, and yeah. Joe, which yeah. is chilling. Yeah, chilling. I mean, uh, in the mosh, who, in the mosh pit with Kyle. <laughs> hitting the mosh pit with Super Duper Kyle. Who had the best fit, do you guys think? Because I have my opinion uh, already kind of cemented. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say it now so you guys don't think I'm copying you guys. I think the women looked amazing. I think the women did great. I already said Sinto, that. Sinto was great. And I think Joe looked really So you cool. just said four people. You said all the women and Joe had your favorite So we have fit. two options left. No, no, no. So, so for me, it's the women. But I'm saying, I just want to shout out Joe. That's still Joe's three people. Was, That's the most PC right, answer. I literally. say Sinto then. I was going to say Sinto. That's exactly why I said it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, everyone looked amazing, but yeah, shout, shout out to Sinter and Joe. I'll give a special shout out to Mario because he had the balls to walk around with his shirt open and he bought a chain online, like a diamond, fake, fake diamond <laughs> chain that was um, sure fake? a mushroom from Mario. And it, I didn't put it together. I was like, wait, what is that? He's like, it's from Mario. I'm like, oh my God, it makes so much sense. I love that he commits to his own personal brand like yeah, that. That's pretty sweet. It's very impressive to see. What about Yard's uh, kit? Yeah, I was just pretty peak yard. Yeah, peak yard. Had some. I think only he would wear that, which yeah. I think. And he, he only he can pull yeah. it off. Only he can pull it off too. So, didn't really say a favorite, but yeah, Gus was my favorite. Gus <laughs> in the cup, people, cup, in the cup, people cup are asking cup. for that singlet. Yeah. So. Well, it's pretty limited edition. Yeah, as in there's like two. <laughs> we have two of them. Shout out to the man from Sound Running who made it. I'm not sure who it actually was. I think Jesse gave it to us at Cross Country Meet. But, but someone, someone, someone else Someone gave it. it to him, yeah. 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 So, very so limited edition. Person. Very maybe, limited. Maybe call me your name so we can shout you out next time. Yeah. So, that's the roundup of the meet for the OAC. It was, it was very, another amazing day for the team. So, it was very hype. It was very cool to be a part of it. 
lit concert after it. Went to In and Out, classic LA meat things. Classic like, fries, terrible. Yeah, terrible <laughs> freaking so fries. They were worse fries. than they were worse than like usual. Because I actually the, don't mind In and Out fries, but these ones were like these ones are shocking. Something they got to fix their potatoes. Burger was pretty good though. Burgers are always solid. I mean, the one thing with In and Out that you're gonna get is consistency in the burger. It was yum. But so the next day we had our meetup in at Stereo Stereoscope Coffee in Newport Beach. Very and impressed by that coffee shop. It was cool so sick. We definitely recommend it to anyone who's in the Newport area. Actually, they I think have, there's heaps of stereoscopes. Yeah, they're all there was around like four LA. or five. So check it out and big thank you to everyone who came out and made it what it was. It was very fun. Especially George and I didn't have to run, so we just got to yeah. chill the whole you time. Got, you guys just uh, <laughs> set us off. Yeah. You Ollie, like coffee cup coaches. Ollie went on a nice run with uh, the rest of our teammates who stayed around. And yeah. we just had a lovely day. Had the meet up in the morning. Uh, spent quite a bit of time just hanging out after it, which was sweet. And then we went to the beach, whose name? CDM. Recommended by the Irvine kids, I think. Yeah. It was, it was so good. Pretty. We went there. We swam. Some of us swam. I was going to say, yeah, some of us swam. We couldn't get Joe or Yarrod in the water. So we tried next time. But it was a beautiful final day in LA. And then we headed to the airport. And now we're back here. So that was our trip. I think after Penn, doing back to back trips is very tiring. So I think we're all pretty tired by then. But honestly, like they went, I think, as smooth, as good as you could ask for. It's always a lot. Uh, big investment from on in both those meets and they made our times pretty awesome so thank you to them uh yeah i can't really say anything else about it apart from it was pretty cool i mean i didn't do anything at either of them so yeah from my perspective yeah all and i was just chilling it was crazy. Just like crazy. two years ago if you went to a sound running meet there was like five of us on the team we were the only people probably wearing on shoes at the meet and no one knew what on was mm-hmm. now so we go to sound running this year we had like 40 people for dinner all on athletes and employees like at the meet plus just an entire meet decked out and on stuff like half the people there wearing on shoes it's just crazy how crazy how the world works feels special the growth gets to be part of something huh yeah it's cool yeah. very cool very very cool so that's our recap i uh, i think that's it from us i think now it's time to pause for a second and then we'll come back with an amazing interview so see you guys in a second and we're back with a very special guest, Mr. Craig Mottram, Buster, the big Mazungo. <laughs> Any other nicknames we're missing? Uh, there's probably a few, but we'll leave it for you for the moment. Um, but yeah, first off, uh, how you doing? Going very well. Um, fantastic to be here with you guys and you're making us feel very welcome in Boulder. So looking forward to the next hour or so of sharing some stories and, and having a good chat. A little bit of chit-chatting. You've been here in Boulder for a couple of days now, getting the team set here OC Oceania I think first off we're just like we said this when we had Devin Allen a few weeks ago it's always like very surreal to us to have these big guests on to I don't know if you feel like you're a big guest but to us you're a massive guest huge huge <laughs> like yeah. I mean, growing up as an Australian runner if you're our age yeah you're the legend I'm sure you're aware of this very much so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll pretend I don't think it's a big deal <laughs> yeah you didn't no, think it's New Zealand it's uh <laughs> Look, great to be here, as I said, and, and I think the shoe's on the other foot now for us back home in Australia, watching what you guys are doing over here. We sort of have been really excited to, to travel across the States and, and get in um, in amongst it over here with um, with your group and, and with Dathan and see how you go about it. And I know from, from my point of view, just in the last couple of days, and, and I know from, from our crew as well, actually sort of humanising you guys a little bit. I know that sounds quite odd, but when you're not involved at, at um, the level that you guys are at, sometimes we, we look up to you. Um, you guys a lot um, and I think for this younger group the OAC Oceania group which I want to rebrand to OAC Down Under by the way that'd be, um, that'd be way, better, way better so we'll see um, but for them to come over and watch learn be involved and actually see you know how you guys do it but also see that you're not doing you know anything that's you know rocket science you're just working hard and they found that out this morning on the long run no doubt we'll talk about that but um, excited to be here there's a lot of people I'd love to catch up with in Boulder, and there's probably a couple I wouldn't, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> they might we'll not want to see we'll me, but later. that's okay. Yeah, yeah. What is it, 15 years since you were last 15 here? 15 years since I was last here. It hasn't changed much, actually, to be honest. That's very I'm not sure if I'm happy to hear that or not, that it hasn't changed much. Yeah. I feel like it would have. you gotta, you got to go down to Powell Street and look at some of the new houses they've built. 
I know house pricing has changed. Yeah, that's yeah. changed dramatically. Yeah, you should have you bought a house well, last time you were here. Oh, but man, if I heard, did that every time I heard someone say that to me, I'd be a wealthy man. But it's, Fine, uh, man. the world's changed, that's for sure. That's what we're trying to do. That's what they keep saying, buy a house. I was like, shit, I need the money. So <laughs> that's, that's what we're working for. But a couple of icebreaker questions to get it going. Just first off, you already mentioned it just there, the long run this morning. We saw... A, a battle of the coaches. <laughs> a resurgence, <laughs> a resurgence, I would call it. A Ritz versus Mottram. Uh, just to set the stage, Ritz was wearing the uh, super shoes. <laughs> I knew I was in all sorts of trouble when I rocked up and he had their Boom Echo 3s on. I think, so what he did this morning to you was pretty normal, but I think he was showing off a little. How, but how did it feel to be going toe-to-toe with Coach Ritz on the line? Well, I feel I was set up a little bit. I, I knew it was happening. Um, well, I got a sense because I've known Dathan for a while, many years ago, we used to compete together, as most of you would know, but um, he did throw me under the bus. We drove five miles into the run and parked at the bottom of the biggest hill, I thought, and he said, right, we're turning around, we're going back up the hill. <laughs> and he said, well, just test how fit you are. And I said, fuck, Nathan, I'll give you the answer to that right now. Not very fit. Um, anyway, we, we ran up the hill and um, he was having a conversation. I was just listening because um, I couldn't talk back at that point. But no, it was great. Look. Awesome to be back and, and obviously, as I've said, watching you guys from afar and now actually getting to catch up with Dathan and, and talk through what you're doing, what your plans are and and um, share some stories from back in the day has, has been fantastic. So the, the long run was good. Ritz is never shy about uh, sharing that he's going to crush someone the next day. Not that he has said it about you. <laughs> oh, I've no doubt he's so many it days, you know, He's like, ah, tomorrow I'm going running with... It'll just be like someone that kind of used to be a runner like someone that works for a brand he's like oh I'm going to crush this person tomorrow he said it Centro like, Centro he said it with, yeah. yeah he was like I'm going to go run with Centro I'm going to kill him I'm like he's going to be called medalist like, I think he can run with you for five miles but it's so funny how often he says I that I think Dathan's still a little bit closer to his career than I am I've moved well and truly past that <laughs> give him a few more years and we'll see what, ha- he's what happens he's grasping at it still he's still he's holding on. Hanging on he's, he's holding on for dear life but I, what impressed me more though was when because I jumped back in the car after a few minutes I'd had enough and and then um, had to come back and, and pick up some of the younger guys. He had gone from where I was, which was off the back, to you guys, to, to Ollie and a few others at the front, and probably running 320s, which so is K-pace. So that's what he does, which is miles. crazy. Is Yeah, he'll, he'll like do what you described, where he'll start somewhere out and run back to the group, and then he'll turn around with the last people. And I don't know if this is just, yeah, just him flexing or what, but he'll go through all the different groups and he'll sprint in between them to catch up. And mind you... Joe Clucker is at the front of our long run running, even though it's early in the run, he's already running six minute mile pace and yeah. he's crushing and Dathan is just closing those gaps. And I mean, it's funny because when Ritz catches up, he is like breathing very hard. Yeah. It's definitely not easy, but it's still very impressive to witness. Yeah. Yeah. Box, Box mentioned it when we got, we got in the van, when you picked him up, uh, Craig, he kind of just went, yeah, Dathan just took the reins of the pace and just dropped it down to the, the 320s to catch up to everybody else. Well, yeah, I did warn. That. I did warn them last night. I said this could turn into a little bit of a competition in the morning. So, hey, <laughs> um, but uh, get involved. very, yeah, very impressive. And I think um, I don't know. Was it? Um, well, one of the boys posted something on Strava. Bucks was telling me on the way home, three forty three average for thirty two k. Yeah, that was Mario, maybe or Yard at a mile Mario. high, which is moving. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. moving. So that's long runs. That's out. that's another. Well, well, that's K pace. Sorry. So yeah. what's that? Six, yeah, six minute miles or thereabouts? It'd be the, probably just under. Yeah. I know Joe. It's quick. So yeah, Joe averaged just under six minute miles for twenty miles this morning. So it was just thirty six k. Welcome to Boulder. That's just another Tuesday <laughs> yeah. in the life training. That, with that's the boys. honestly like Colorado, like OAC, kind of like that kind of. That's the vibe out here. Yeah. That's what they. That's what they do. So yeah, as you said, just honest hard work. But moving into the second icebreaker question. If you were running today, like you're in the primary career, 2023, whatever, what would your PBs be? Oh, um, it's a very good question. I mean, you're alluding to the technology and the pacing lights and all of those exactly, sort of things. Exactly. But um, I'd have to say they're what they are. I mean, you can only speculate as to what you think they might be. But I think they'd be a lot quicker. I think they'd be a lot quicker. <laughs> I'm being Personally, modest. I'm that was being a very modest, very modest answer. Um, well, I'll let me warm up a Ritz little bit. Ritz is not quite as modest. <laughs> <laughs> Back to Ritz. I'm going to run 12.40. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I think it, it may be a little bit quicker, but, um, you know, I, I don't know is the answer to that. We'll, we'll just keep them as they are because I'm quite happy with what I, what I did yeah. mm-hmm. um, and let you guys now take them to the next level. Is there yeah. one aspect, though, like... 
do you think, oh, I'd love to have had that in my career, like just to test it out? The lights. The lights. Yeah, the you first time I've actually seen it in, yeah. in, re in real life was at Mount Sac on the weekend and, and watching the lights, I think, would have made a massive difference. Yeah. Even yeah. more so to control the pace early yeah. as well. So I think from that point of view, the, the pacing lights, do I like them? It's an interesting question. Do I think they should be in the bigger meets? Maybe not. I like the racing side of, uh, of our sport and I like the championship style of racing. So I think it serves a purpose. But in terms of the times, yeah, people are getting quicker. They're not getting a lot quicker. The best guys are actually not getting quicker than the best guys back when I was running. But the depth and the, the volume of athletes that are running faster is greater. Well, so that, I think that really yeah. supports that. They're not necessarily better. That's the thing. Even if they're running quicker time trials, it, I mean, obviously you'll, there'll always be questions about if you match up the greats from all the different eras. But mm. I think there'd be a very strong argument that your era of professional running was the strongest. Still, we had we had very good strength in in the five k, ten k, and fifteen hundred. Obviously, El Garouge, Legat, um, those guys. I remember lining up. Oh, sorry, I'll take it back. No stories. <laughs> Not being banned from stories. No, but no. two thousand and. Four, I remember lining up in the 5K final in Athens and looking up at the flame and, you know, my coach said at the time, take it in when you get out there because, you know, these things don't come around all the time. And so I had a look at the flame and, you know, fantastic. And then looked to the left, I had El Garouge and Bikili and then looked to my right, I had Gabriel Celesi and a few others. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm taking it in. I'm, I'm, it's uh, too much. It's I'm too taking much. it in, but it's, yeah, it's, it's there's a bit coming out. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, look, it, there was a lot of... Yeah, you know, really, really good athletes back then that were, were pushing the, the boundaries of what the sport could do. Um, and, you know, even, even today, it's the, it's the same situation. They're just different names. Mm -hmm. you know, the sport's always evolving, always progressing, and there's the next generations coming through year on year. And you guys are at the, peak, the, you know, the top of it at the moment, but in four or five or six years from now, there'll be another group. Yeah. And you'll be just like me sitting there doing podcasts in... Um, in wherever the next famous training location is, and it may be Boulder, it may not be. Maybe Melbourne. It may be, well, <laughs> Maybe yeah, Melbourne. well, we'll talk about that in a bit. But, um, you know, enjoy your time while you're here and enjoy the opportunities that are presented because, you know, as much as I loved my time in the sport, it, it does move past you very quickly. Oh, man. That's so much wisdom right there. I feel yeah. like that just sparks off so many questions. I think uh, one of the things that I did want to ask you, I kind of wanted to ask you later, but right now I think it would be a great moment. Do you have advice for us as professional runners that maybe wouldn't be the same advice that you would give to, let's say, a more casual or even an elite runner? Specifically looking at professional running, what in your mind is it that separates, you know, winning a medal, yeah, I making think, a final? I think you, we may have even been off, off air when you said this, but everyone in the competitions these days at the, at the nat or international level, at championship level is talented very talented they're not there because they haven't got talent they're there because they want it as much or more than the next person so i think when you line up and i listed some names before everyone almost everyone in the final of those events and in the diamond leagues has the ability to compete to win those races it's the athletes that want it the most are the ones that position themselves in you know in the race to to compete to win and you see it so often the athletes necess don't necessarily believe they position themselves in the middle and then fall out the back when the when there's a point in the competition where you've got to decide if you're all in or not. Um, and I, I do a lot of coaching with high school kids in Australia as well as the, you know, the OAC down under, Oceania group. Uh, and it's the same. You know, the, the, the rules are the same in competition and the psychology is very similar. Um, you've got to opt into the competition when it happens. Um, and I think if I was to give you advice, it wouldn't certainly be around competition because you're all very good at it, you're experienced and you're professional in, in the way you go about it. It would be around uh, enjoying it taking it in, living the lifestyle as long as you can, uh, and making decisions that are going to better your running uh, while, while you're in it. And you've already done that by obviously being in Boulder and, and being part of the OAC with Dathan and everything else. But when you go to places, um, you know, take it in. Spend, spend a couple of hours. You guys do it. Better than what we did, actually. Uh, back in the day, I've got my passport looks amazing, but I couldn't tell you anything about the cities we went to. Mm -hmm. But you guys with your you know, coffee pod, whatever this thing's called. No, <laughs> no, no that, that's the correct name. I don't know what it is. That's the correct name. Um, that's the correct name. You know, with, with your running groups and all that sort of stuff at Mount Sac, and like you're really engaging with, with people and, um, and you know, taking in the experience, which I think is awesome because when you, when you look back and you think about it, you've probably got 10 years in the sport and you've got 30 or 40 years beyond the sport and you want to you do the best you can, but you want to try to set yourself up a little bit as well and that can be through the networks you make and the opportunities you have and... Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. enjoy where you are, guys, because it it, um, it doesn't last forever. Yeah, Funny how we could bring it in the pot. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's all we need to know. Yeah. No, that's some wisdom. But I think 
think um, that is something that we have talked about before, like kind of similar vibe. I think the fact that all of us went to college almost gave us, it's like a microcosm of your professional career in a way where college is four or five years and it's four or five years of some of the best experiences you've ever had. And in the way it's set up where you have like these team bus rides to go to meets or I don't know, any of you were famous for going to playing laser tag the night before or whatever they do. You really get to experience these amazing things with your teams at the meets and all that. But it teaches you to enjoy it because we all look back on our college careers and we're like, wow, that was so much fun. And we just know it's never going to happen again. Yeah, it's finite. It's not, you can't keep going. I mean, some people try oh, and after <coughs> 10 years in college, but a lot, of, a lot of the time you only get a finite amount of time and that's the same, similar thing with professional career or just sport in general. So. Yeah, so we're, yeah. I think that kind of taught us a little bit like, yeah, you got to make the most of it. Definitely don't take it for granted. And yeah, take a, take a moment to appreciate where you are when you get to go on these cool trips. That's like, so for example, last Sunday, uh, after the meet, everyone else, like we were going on an early flight and we pushed back our Sunday flight into the evening and we did a little coffee club meetup and we went out to Newport Beach and just hung out during the day. It was like such a great day. We actually got people, we actually got Joe Clicker to change his flight. Usually <laughs> that guy's type, hey, like I'm leaving today. He actually didn't sleep, changed his flight back and forth during <laughs> the night. Around. Yeah. He changed Crazy. it and you got a hundred dollar, it was like hundred dollars more, but then he got it waived because he's yeah. 1K. We couldn't get him in the water though. I think we tried. Next, <laughs> next time we go back to LA. Yeah. Yeah. What I did, a notice at that meet was obviously they had the concert afterwards with um what was the guy's name super duper Kyle. whatever it was he was a track fiend or something i don't know but um you know we had some of the younger crew the down under crew in there having a good time and you guys were off doing your autographs and all of that sort of stuff but then you got back you know i saw you running in at the end of it yeah. like back in my day i would have been home in bed like yeah. there is no way we would have engaged with that sort of stuff and true credit <clears throat> to you guys because you really you do the job on the track, but you seem to enjoy life around the track, which I think is really, really important. I, th I think we're very lucky to be in just a good environment for that. I think what we have here in Boulder, it's all set up for a very long term. It's set up for being a professional runner for a very long time, which I would say, and you could probably speak on this well, not all setups have that same long term sustainability approach to them. Is that a leading question? <laughs> <laughs> well, it can I've, be. been, I've been here before. Um, Absolutely. I mean, and that's what the OAC is about. You guys can talk more about the, you know, the setup. You've been doing it far longer than I have uh, with this model. But I think um, it's changing, and it's changing for the better in Australia as well. Um, and all groups are, are looking at that more sustainable approach. That I mean, wellbeing is a big word, if, in particular off the back of the last three years with COVID, in, and in, more specifically in Australia, we had it pretty tight down there in terms of what we could and couldn't do. So actually working with athletes, managing their lifestyle and providing an environment that is more suitable for them longer term is, is a big part of what my role is. And you know, I've no doubt you've got questions about coaching and all of that sort of stuff, but it's not a one size fits all model anymore. It just can't be with the next generation that's coming through. Uh, they're very well educated. Um, you know, they have, um, what's the right word? They, had diff they have different personalities and they want to do different things. And I can see it in your group as well. You've got like you three are, are, are probably quite similar, outgoing, chatty, then you've got a few that are a bit quieter and have their own quirks and all of that sort of stuff. So you've got to be able to work with different personalities and different athletes from all over the world that have different backgrounds. So anyone that's refusing to make change or is refusing to move with the times is going to find a sustainable group really tough moving forward. Mm -hmm. And yeah, expanding on that, I, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people listening already know it, but we did, I don't guess we haven't even said it. So you're the head coach of the OEC Oceania. Yes. Which it formed, when did, when did it officially launch? In it January? It officially launched in February, a few days before Ollie ran the mile at, um, at yeah. Lakeside Stadium down there. Ollie was actually there, which was awesome to have him down there. It was pretty sweet, actually. <laughs> I, 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 I kind of wish you two were, were there too, because like being Oceania boys, or down under boys, um, to see kind of what we've, that community kind of, we've created with professional running kind of starting to, build a bit in Melbourne with, with On. I wish you guys were there to see it because it was a pretty cool opening. Yeah, Ollie did rave about the launch. Well, it's a legacy that you guys will be proud of beyond your time in sport because without the success of this team, it wouldn't happen in, in Oceania and our region. So obviously the European team launched a year and a, a bit ago. Um, the Oceania team officially launched in February. However, you know these conversations with Steve and 
Um, and Dathan actually, he was probably my final interview actually, he gave me the tick of approval, or maybe he didn't, I don't know, but Steve overruled it maybe. <laughs> but I, Steve said, you've got to catch up with Dathan, if he doesn't like you, then you, you're not a chance. But, um, you know, they were a year and a half ago. Yeah, so this, it's been in the works. It's been in yeah. the works for a long time, um, which I'll, we'll talk about in a minute, because I have an issue with you guys in this pod thing that you're doing, in terms of episode from December. Um, and a question that you discussed, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. But... <laughs> It's, it's what we need in Australia at the moment and you know there are some other groups that are doing great things and, and we all know who, who they are but having a group down there that support, uh, that's supported by a global brand and a very innovative global brand is prepared to, you know, to put the backing behind it um, is what we need and we've got five athletes at the moment, hopefully by the end of the year we'll have eight uh, and then we'll continue to grow. Mm -hmm. um, you guys keep doing and what you're doing and shouldering the weight and expectation of everyone and we'll just sort of cruise in under the radar <laughs> no, and let, do our thing. We let, we let Ollie take Yeah, well, that's yeah, exactly yeah, right. Yeah. Ollie take He's got big shoulders, so you're lucky. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It is very cool to think that, you know, we, that we've played a part over the last couple of years that, that led to other teams being formed on like the other side of the world or Especially for you guys at home. Well, because it is the opportunities that perhaps we would have loved to have had mm. if we were younger. 100%. I mean, like, can you remember... I mean, Morgan and I particularly running around Stettingwell Park thinking like, imagine if there was like a real like professional group. Like, yeah, if you can make it work. And make it work. And then that's why I wanted, I wish you guys were there to see it because um, the way it was launched, the way that they were able to engage with the athletes as well as Craig, it's like, it's really cool. It's a professional team, you know, that's, that's what mm. every kid dreams of in this sport, which is hard to find in, in Australia and uh, Melbourne's a pretty cool city. So I do have a little bone to pick with it though that I, that I feel like I keep sharing. It is OAC down under, but... It's quite specifically OAC Australia currently. Now. <laughs> I, would, for now. I would love to see a. a we've New had Zealander some we've had some roster. chats with one or two New Zealand athletes. Um, they'll be ongoing, but we're we're working on a on a particular athlete at the moment. And once well, we'll see whether that gets over the line, but um, that may change a few things as well moving forward, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, you'll be represented. You'll be God, but this is a, a, a nice segue, Ollie, into the, the podcast you did in December, oh, here we go. where there was a question that you posed. Um, in your headlines could you be a professional athlete oh. in australia oh, now yeah, you I raised did. three particular points and you've changed your tune already i can see you saying oh, i'd love to be a pro athlete in australia <laughs> i don't think um at the time which surprises me that you didn't know that the oac oceania was happening and you still had a podcast saying could you have a could you have a professional running career in australia and you were uncertain however the three <laughs> points you raised were based mainly around the support yeah. the group and the environment. Yeah. Now I'm here to tell you that that is all changed. in Australia, and there is, and most certainly and most definitely is a way to be a professional athlete in Australia, and we now have a group that would welcome athletes wanting to be in Australia and training from there. There you go. Well, <laughs> I, knew, I knew the Oceania group was happening, but I didn't think, I think I'd get more You didn't trouble. think I'd listen to the podcast. No. <laughs> I stayed I up till 2 a.m. this morning, I'll need to listen to that shit, that absolute rubbish that came out of your mouth. I, I, <laughs> I'll take that. I, I also believe that if I mentioned that there was a group being formed in, in by on in uh, in Melbourne, that I might get in trouble by Stephen or Steve because I have gotten in trouble by saying certain things I shouldn't have about the brand that's not officially public. But yeah, definitely those three. I mean, those three elements I felt like growing up because Morgan actually counted me. He did. He, he came into he back said, for us. He said, "Yep, I would live in Australia. I would train there." I mean, Morgan lives what five five minutes away. From five minutes joke from Centennial Park. It's not, it's not Melbourne, but Sydney's probably best place to train is in Centennial Park. And I think Morgan educated me a little bit on that episode, but definitely uh, going through that situation now, seeing the growth of those three elements that you're bringing in, it's going to be really interesting to see, particularly with Australian athletics, how far this is going to go. Because we all know, and George too, Australian track and field is really, really, really um, talented and got a lot of potential there. So having this group is just going to create new, uh, new avenues for it, which is going to be sick. Yeah, one, one question I did want to ask about the OEC Oceania because being based in Australia, you have a whole set of unique challenges that you don't have being based here. It's just very different being based in Australia compared to being based in Europe and especially being based compared to being based in America. If you were to say kind of like the goals of OEC <laughs> Oceania. Sure. I do, do feel a little bit distracted at the moment. Our CEO's falling asleep. He's, he's going, <laughs> Gus is having a little power nap. Maybe he'll be back by the end of the episode. But um, yeah, if you just sum up kind of like, I don't know if the purpose of OC, like of the team or more the goals, I think. Because the thing is in America, it's I think it's more clear because everyone that is on our team 
except for a couple, went to college here. So they're 23, 24 by the time they come out of college. And by the time you make it out of college, if you're like at the top end, you're pretty much good enough to be, yeah. you know, on like competing at Worlds, for example. Whereas in Australia, if you take someone at 17, 18, you're not going to have the same expectations for them. We have several things to look at. You, you call them challenges um, to setting up the team, and they most definitely are. But the way I view being in Australia and the way I viewed my time in the sport and still do is that those are big positives for us. I mean, Australia, in my opinion, is still the greatest country in the world to live. Um, when it's winter here and you're on treadmills, um, we're in 25 to 35 degree sunshine. So I could pose the question back to you, would you rather do your winter in the winter or would you rather do it in the summer and then do your track season in the summer? So in essence, we're 12 months of the year following the summer. So for the athletes that are good enough, during our summer track season, which in essence your, is your winter, they can be doing their base training um, in beautiful weather, in a beautiful environment and actually utilise the opportunity to do that. Um, which is great, and yes, th there are challenges obviously with that, but um, you raise the sort of age demographic, that is a really good question, but one of the things that we've got to consider with setting up this team and, and how we go about setting up this team is the goals. Um, obviously 2026, we have the Commonwealth Games in Victoria, um, regional Victoria, so the athletics is actually going to be in Ballarat, mm -hmm. um, which is about an hour and a half out of Melbourne, uh, and in 2032 we have the Olympic Games in Brisbane. So setting up a younger team in Australia is the goal because we want athletes to be in their prime for, um, for those events. And if we wait until athletes are coming out of college at 24, 25 years old, by the time they get to the Olympics in, in Brisbane, they may be at the back end of their career, they may not. Um, but we also want to have some, control is not the right word, but when athletes, student athletes finish year 12, high school at school, they're 18 years old and the, the general, um, direction for them is to go to college in America. Mm -hmm. and so we lose them for four or five years. So we have to kind of get them before they go. So we want to make sure that athletes in Australia get the opportunity still A, to go to college because college is fantastic. It's, we just can't replicate that in Australia, but we want to give them the option to stay in Australia and, and turn professional and have every um, opportunity to be a professional athlete based in Australia. If we keep waiting for athletes that are 24, 25, then you know it's a diff your, that's what your team does. Yeah. Right? So that's you guys. Mm -hmm. We understand that. We know where we sit in the pecking order at the moment in terms of what the priorities for the team are. Your job um, and Dathan's team is to you know be at that international level of competition and major championships and trying to win medals. Ours is a more of a longer term approach where we're wanting to build build the team, build the athletes, and develop medalists over the next four to ten years. Um, and in reality, that's the team that we're building. Um, and we've got some older, mature athletes in the team to help guide the younger ones that are coming through. And I think you'll see over the next 12 to 24 months, uh, the demographic of athletes that we're looking to get in are, are very talented, um, but are probably on the more of the younger, in the younger age bracket than, than the sort of mid to late 20s. Mm -hmm. I think it makes a lot of sense, it actually, does. for a brand to, to kind term. of have both bases covered. Yeah. Yeah, because the Europe team's similar, and the, they they have they have a couple of younger athletes too. I would say to to help develop them, as well. I've always got like George Mills, who's uh, and Robert Farkin, who's an Olympian, that have already kind of bit are at that stage at more than say pr like kind of prime section of their career. But um, definitely, yeah, creating a group like that with a lot of younger athletes, and like you say, getting them before college, that really gives them another option to say like I don't think college is for me. Going to the US. I really want to run professional, stay in Australia because of the, like you said, all the benefits you get from it, as well as being able to go to university uh, in Australia, which you can do um, now. So, I mean, that look would... at him changing his tune on the. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Wait, who's he's talking right because now? The there, talking? Because the options there, because the options it is now. Is the, the option didn't moment? exist until February. So <laughs> that's what I'm saying the options there. Now. You, you admit, there's a good point that needs to probably be raised as well. It, it, if it was just the Oceania team or the Down Under team, it, it probably would have challenges to just do it in Australia. But the success of you guys and now the European team and the base in St. Moritz and yeah. Germany and Boulder and everything else is a huge appeal for athletes to want to be a part of it. But it's also a huge op you know, opportunity and, and training base for, for this Oceania team to actually you know, transition from Australia to the US and then on into Europe. So without what you guys have been doing and been able to build here, Yes, I do think it would be it could be challenging, but off the back of this global movement, if you want to call it that, the OAC, I think you could base a team anywhere. Yeah, and uh, and could be really successful. Use all those ecosystems. Absolutely. Yeah.
Australia. We 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 went to training winter training camp in Australia. You got to. Well, I'm going to pose that to you. That was one of the things you sh- you should come and have a we yeah, wanted have to do some time year. in Australia. We, we, to. we tried to do it last year for World Cross, yeah. and then Dathan. Dathan, Dathan I don't know what, what I don't know what happened. Well, no one. Wasn't we going to go to someone's farm? Was that your farm? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> George's farm. Yeah. Yeah. farm. That was the plan, and then it all fell apart when no one. Were there sheep on that farm? Of there course, are many. Of course, there's sheep. <laughs> there's yeah. Many we sheep on that farm. Yep. Uh, from what you're saying, it sounds like OEC Oceania is by far the best team to go. With. <laughs> <laughs> because because then you 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 train in Australia in Australia summer, and then you come to Boulder, take advantage. Just when of, it got nice. Yeah, Literally take advantage got nice, of the nice like weather. last week. And then you'll go to St. Moritz when it's finally nice weather there. So thank you. My job is done. <laughs> <Marketing is finished. laughs> um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I used to get asked this all the time. You know what? You know, is it difficult training in Australia and all that? And I, I used to think, well, because I had a lot of competition from athletes from Africa and other parts of the world, and I used to look at it and think, well, if I was living in Kenya, the environment is nowhere near as nice as it is in Australia, in my opinion. We have the ability to do altitude over the summer months, not so much in the winter, but we can come to Boulder or Flagstaff or wherever in the winter. Um, we have unbelievable medical, we have unbelievable support, un- unbelievable facilities, home life is great. Yeah. that we really do not have an excuse not to be competitive internationally. And any athlete from Australia that sits there and says, oh, it's too far away, rubbish. Look, we, were, we left Melbourne 13 hours later, we were in LA. I slept eight hours on the plane. It's as easy as you know, travelling to Perth, really. I mean, it's not... The world is a lot smaller. And <clears throat> with technology and travelling and everything now, you can base wherever you feel like you need to be. And that, that goes back to my original point with setting up these teams and different personalities for athletes. We've got athletes in our group that have happily spend six months on the road and then we've got some obviously the younger ones that can only do two or three weeks at a time before they need to go home so having that flexibility to be able to work out of you know somewhere that the athletes are comfortable is really important mm-hmm. wow we're sold yeah. we're sold we're gonna you have any spots on the team i'm gonna clip that and send yeah, that to ritz <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're going to australia please don't send all ritz all this time. sorry <laughs> mate sorry. I'm, I'm like calculating in my head right now what, like, I, what I should say um, <laughs> what I should say? <laughs> it's, oh my god! Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it just that the travel thing. I, I agree with. I also like it. Good miles. Good, yeah, <laughs> good yeah. miles. Also, like <laughs> coffee's good in Australia. Yeah, I do miss a, a good breakfast in Australia from a coffee shop. Yeah, I miss that every day. I love. I love, I really like the idea of breaking up. I think Australia to Europe does suck, but I think if you break it up with a stint in yeah, America, yeah. It, it's super nice. It's like the, definitely the best way to do it. So you guys are doing it right, but um, kind of yeah. trend. You want to see anything no, no, more right? Transitioning away from the OAC stuff and getting more into Buster, mm. Craig Mortram. Um, we could talk forever about just your career, as we said. I, did you hold all the Australian records at one point from the mile to the 10K? Uh, I don't think I ever held the 10K track record. Sean okay. Crichton held that before. Ben St. Lawrence broke it, actually, I think. And then mm-hmm. it's now, is it Stewie's? It's Rainer. Oh, 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 is it Ray Jack? Yeah, yeah it got broken too. by Tunin. Um, oh, yeah, yeah no, that's right. It's yeah. progressed. But no, from uh, 2K through to 5K, yes. Yeah, oh, the mile, actually, sorry. Yeah. Have you got the you mile had, record had, now? You, I, no, I, Stewie broke it. And then, Stewie broke it, then I broke yeah. it. You had it before, yep. I think. Yeah, so, 2022. Growing up, like your name was on the uh, on everything. Is that's so, Well, I'm a 5K runner, and I've always been a 5K runner, so that's kind of like the big one. And then everything else you did, having the big balls and all that stuff. Do you get asked about that a lot? Quite a bit. Yeah. I've got four of my own children who YouTube it and want to know what that means. But um, yeah, quite a bit. All the Americans ask me about it. They always ask me, it's like, oh yeah, did, did you talk to Craig? Like, did you, like, How big are his balls? They love the interviews. Like, the interviews are like, I was like, I was like, yeah, I mean, I love them too. So we yeah. bond over that. Um, what was the first time you heard someone call you the big Mazungo and how did you react? Uh, it was in Bushy Park in London, and it was the Kenyan group that lived in Park Road, which um, in Teddington, which is where they, they all used to base. Yeah. Um, and they used to say Jumbo Mazungo, which is hello, white man. Um, and then when you talk to them more one-on-one, it would be M- Big Mazungo, which is big white man. So it's actually <laughs> quite boring, really, when you think of it. But, um, you know, they, they were... They could have called anyone, though, that, and they chose they you. They chose you, yeah. Came Possibly, the yeah. Mzungo. Well, Every- I think they probably did refer to everyone as the big Mzungo. It's just you only heard them talking about me. I don't know, but... <laughs> not, um, everyone, not everyone has a documentary. No. Yeah. Yeah. You watch it, right? Uh, yeah, we we'll put it on at the house like two I weeks w- ago. I watched it many times. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. It's amazing. It's so good. It's so good. Do you watch that? It's like, no, nah, is that too? Like, I have watched it, yes. I haven't watched it in a few years, obviously. But I do. it does come up all the time. In fact, it came up earlier today. I, I borrowed a bike off someone um, in Boulder who was telling me they just watched it on the treadmill last night. Just, <laughs> just to reminisce. Um, 
It's and that's a, it's a funny story how that came about because it was based around the Commonwealth Games in 2006. But I actually don't think there's much. Well, there's a little bit of footage, obviously, in it when I, when I fell over and all of that. But they they followed me for six months. So Nike, um, were they had to say Nike on this. Yeah, thing? yeah, yeah. So Ni- Nike. Um, I was a Nike athlete way back then, and they funded. Uh, a film crew before all of this social media rubbish that everyone does now and these pod things. Um, it was literally camera, followed me around for six months. So Falls Creek, Ballarat, all these places that I trained before the Commonwealth Games to get footage like a big brother behind the scenes type of thing. Um, and then to win the gold medal at the Commonwealth Games was going to be the culmination of this documentary. And then it went on um, Alpha magazine, which was like the inside sport magazine. It was sort of stuck on the front and you paid two bucks for this magazine and you took the DVD home. Um, and then I fell over at the Commonwealth Games. And they said, well, we, we can't do much with that. <laughs> so oh, they, they cut the, you know, that sort of concept and changed it more to a bit of an evolution. Remember Nike's were make, making the free shoes and all of that yeah, sort of stuff like back measuring then? measuring your foot and stuff. Yeah, so it became a bit more of a... Um, like a brand. Brand thing for that sort of stuff. And I did say to them at the time, if you just give me four months, the World Cup's on in Athens... And I'll, I won it in '02, and I'm going to win it again in four months. If you want, if you want me winning something, just give me four months and wait for that. And Nike said, "No, nah, they couldn't put do it, it out now. They couldn't wait." Um, and then you went on to win. And then I went on to win. <laughs> <laughs> I did let them know, but um, it, uh, it's been it went. I think you know what? It's probably more popular now than it was back then. I guess it's just the way of the world. Like yeah. back then, like YouTube was just in its infancy. Yeah, and it's now gone online or whatever it is that you do. And um, people talk about it quite a bit, which is pretty cool. Definitely recommend it to anyone who hasn't seen it. Just look up the Big Mazungo. There are so many amazing moments. It really captures some really cool moments and some great one-liners. I think <laughs> the, I don't know if this is like too much information, but like we literally used to like quote it as a joke. Like when, when we were kids, we'd be like, uh, "What's what's my favorite one?" Sean, you know Sean Guinea? Yes. He used to always walk around and say. I ordered a pizza and <laughs> I, I, yeah, I read about what I had, what I read about the next morning. Um, didn't get the top, didn't say the topping though. Barbecue chicken, by the way. <laughs> that was from crust pizza. I don't know if you, if you know what crust pizza is, I but I still have pizza. barbecue chicken pizza from crust every week. Hell yeah. Crust is pretty big now. It's massive. Yeah. yeah. Crust is taken over, but. Did you have that pre rate Yeah. The night Ab- before. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And then I, the night after, because it was at the MCG, I was living in Richmond which um, is another plug. The gym is just in Richmond, which is right next to the MCG that Perfect. we have in, uh, in Melbourne. But I, w- I walked from home to the warm-up track and had an escort. Epic. Um, past all the nightclubs, which were full of people getting blind before they went to watch me run at the, M- <laughs> the MCG. So it was like chaos walking yeah. down there. Got in there, um, did my warm-up, went to the MCG, ran, you know, you know, the 5K and whatever. And then I'll tell you, this is a good story, actually. This is probably one of my more fondest memories of my time in, in track and field. After the 5,000, I finished second. Um, Augustine Chogi beat me. He, he was phenomenal. Um, we ran 3.57 for the final mile, and he beat me by a second and a half, both under 13 minutes. Um, One of the most amazing Clearly, races. Gus doesn't give a shit. <laughs> That's a good story. Gus, um, we got and, and afterwards, I was drug tested, and, so, and I still had to do a warm down. So we were sort of contemplating where to do it, and the the guy that sort of oversaw the MCG, the facilities manager, was walking past and he said, listen, Craig, if you want to warm down on the infield, you can do that and then just give me a nod when you're done and I'll turn the lights off. So I had 100,000 people at the MCG screaming, you know, excited for the race or whatever. Then 15 minutes later, got to do 20 minutes, just easy jogging on the grass of the infield with not a soul in there. Oh, that's and then as I walked off, gave him the thumbs up and turned the lights off to the MCG and I walked home like nothing had happened. That sounds like the end of a movie. Like, it, there was six. Yeah. it was sick. It was re- and then we got one photo of it. It was yeah. um it was actually really cool. That's awesome. So the next com games, not at the MCG. Were no, a regional Ballarat. regional Victoria so yeah. Ballarat. So they're redoing the stadium where if you know footy, where the Western Bulldogs play um, a few of their home games in Ballarat. Um, they're gonna spend some money up there and redo the stadium and it won't be MCG big. It'll be maybe thirty thousand or something yeah. like. It'll be good. Um, Ballarat has a bit of a. It has, Ballarat has a cool running history oh, as well. With uh, yep. was that Monaghetti? Well, Steve Monaghetti lives still does live in Ballarat. Lee Troop, who's now in Boulder, actually did a lot of his training in Ballarat. And actually, before the Com Games in '06, I went to Ballarat 
uh, and did a lot of training to get out of Melbourne because it was pretty hectic in the months. I reckon it will, it'll, it'll be hard to get a seat in track and field, especially reckon. if it's only thirty thousand. Particularly with I I don't like, quote me on the number of people, but it yeah. won't be massive. It won't be as big as the MCG, but I feel like a lot of people will turn up because it's Com Games. The Aussies love Com Games. Yeah, and uh, it's going to be sold out. It's good. It'll be one hundred percent. It'll be popular, and yeah, but heaps of New Zealanders there too. Yeah, Kiwis will be rocking up to watch George at the steeple. Well, you would have seen that <laughs> the vibe has shifted a bit in Australia when when Ollie ran a few months ago at the lakeside track there, the Mori Plant meet. It, I don't know if you know this, but I was in the warm up area when you guys were lining up for the mile. You were on early in the in the meet, and there were still more more than a thousand people yeah. outside the gate trying to get in. And there were, I think, whoever was organising the meet had you know three or four people on the ticket box thinking we might get five hundred. No one gives a shit about that. But, <laughs> and there was like eight thousand yeah. people, and they Amazing. couldn't get in. Yeah. Like, yeah. and then it ended up just opening the gates and letting everyone in because you guys were about to run. So the appeal of having you know, our best athletes competing at home is what people want to see. So. It was pretty, it was probably the coolest and biggest track we have done in Australia. Ever. It was great. It, think, was, it was sick. I think post Tokyo Olympics, it's been like a big shift. Yeah. I think the Tokyo Olympics, I don't know, maybe because it was on at prime time in Australia, the athletics, I think it made some celebrities and then you got stars. I, I think after probably you won the, the way you won the gold at Com Games. You're a legend forever in Australian athletics now. So. <laughs> a, a legend is born, remember? Yeah, a legend, that was the, a legend that was the is the title. Born. Don't do that to my head, bro. <laughs> no, but that, that was all the true. Thing, that was the one true. thing that I did love about um, what they did with Murray Plamby was that, like, Fred Curley, for example, big celebrity, big star. The way they were able to get people around, there's like that quorum section we got into for drug testing, because me and Fred were getting drug testing after the race, and just these swarms of kids throwing stuff out. And Fred could have just walked straight through. He spent like, as well, I spent a bit of time, but he spent like an hour just going through everyone's stuff, getting photos. Like that's what kids will look back on and go, I want to go back. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to a track meet. So like, they did a really good job of getting access to You know what, Ollie? The the amount of kids that know who you guys are now, like we, you know, outside of the OAC stuff, our company works in schools in Australia and we've got about 22,000 kids in the programs we run. They will listen to this. They will watch (laughs) your posts. Like when, when stuff goes out, on social media and they know we're here and running yeah. with you and all that. the messages we get like people see this and yeah. they watch it and you have no idea the influence that you have um on the on the young australians all of you not just let's yeah, not just talk about say. ollie he's good but you're all good um and that impact is only is nothing but positive and when you see them come out to the track like that they will remember i still get kids that are now adults that come to me with a photo of me with a bib you know when they were 15 at the yeah. track and they've now got their son or their daughter and they're like remember this photo and I'm pretending oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> no idea. but they no they remember it yeah. right? like, and that, that makes a difference and that, that'll be the next Ollie or the next Morgan or whatever so yeah you, you guys are doing an awesome job Ollie's here's a balloon right? <laughs> fucking massive it's fucking yeah. massive but that, that's that's the one thing is like I think we were all three of us are very much we, we owe a lot to the sport but we also want to make sure that like, this sport has such a positive impact yeah. on Australians and I think um, having yeah, having all the six, the kind of momentum I'd say, of what's going on in the track and field world, uh, kind of building up in Australia, it's just awesome because it gives kids a bit of, bit of excitement. It's very surreal to hear that hear that we're having an impact back home. Yeah. Because when we're in when we're here, I mean, I think all professional runners are like this to an extent. You're in such a bubble, and we put out this podcast and try and interact via this method but still we're in such a bubble and it's just like we record this silly we do little get, thing we do get like the group runs for example yeah when we go to meets you do, do feel it but yeah. I want to go back home now so bad and get the experience <laughs> back there because yeah I never really had that before because it's really hard as a as an athletics athlete to have any level of like fame or popularity back home unless you're Craig Marcham I think that was that must be the height of like fame for an athletics person was 2006 yeah home games for you right for me in my career it was but we i was very lucky actually because we had the olympics in sydney in 2000 which i don't know well you guys were only babies back then but freeman obviously was massive Mm -hmm. and and the years preceding that the deck and so this is almost where we are now so from 1992 93 through to 2000 there was a huge injection of interest funding and everything else because we had the olympics in sydney um, and 25 or 20 years later, we're here again with the Brisbane Olympics in 2032. And there's this momentum starting to build and having the Commonwealth Games in 26 as well. I think that we're going into a real purple patch in athletics in Australia, A, from a performance point of view, but also public perception, interest, um, value. You know, you guys are, have got the opportunity to really make something um, stick over the next six to ten years and and um, and really come out of this with with a, a hell of a lot of experience and and um, 
you know, great opportunities. So well, you're we're in a really good spot. Can we make it 2032? <laughs> I, 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 need, I need to be there. If, if we gotta, we gotta running, do something. If I'm not running or I'm, I'm just going to the watch, I will be there. We should but... maybe take a couple of years off, mm. like right now. Extend, extend the career. All right, we'll text Reds. <laughs> so, um, how old will you be? Thirty-four. <laughs> it's not, it's not impossible. Wait, did, wait. Mm, close to that. Cl- You're in 1997. Yeah. What is that? Thirty-five, technically. Yeah, thirty-five. So like. Oh. That's, oh, a lot, that's a lot of that's a lot prime of marathon. It's a lot of Mountain Dew. I mean, that you've dude, there's, there's people competing in the 5K, 10K that are 35 years old. Absolutely. The issue is Australian athletics is going to be extremely tough and hard to make that team. So yeah. you'd have to be on your A game. But um, yeah, whether I'm competing or not, I'd love to be there. You got to be there for 100 Olympics. <sighs> got to be there. Uh, that would be so amazing. But yeah. so in 2006, big documentary about you trying to win the Com Games. We should meet Nick Willis. Ended up winning. <laughs> he did. Yep. <laughs> When you in the race that you fell in, how uh, how confident were you that it wasn't gonna that you were gonna oh. have? A, were you that? Which fair? answer? Which answer do you want? No, uh, I, I can yeah. give you the politically the, correct answer. No, which I don't want is, that shit. Look, I was reasonably confident I'd be competitive, <laughs> um, but I, I honestly thought that I would win. Quite, and I think if you asked Nick, he would have he would probably say that I would have been the one to beat as well. Mm. I haven't asked him, but um, <laughs> we can ask him. We'll just you can it. you can ask him, him, but. We would have had a good race. I would have come down to the last 300. And I, my, look, my plan for that race, happy to tell you what my plan was, was we had it all set up. It was, you know, you couldn't have scripted it, well, any better and any bloody worse, to be quite honest. Um, <laughs> the, you know, we, I had pace set up through eight, two laps through 800, and then I was just going to take it on. I was going to run 53 and yeah. be away and wave, wave to the crowd in the last 200 <laughs> and enjoy it. That was the plan. And at 7.50 in, fell over. So, and ironically, the guy that fell behind me was Andy Baddeley, who was the guy that I was training with for the few months leading into the Commonwealth <laughs> oh, Games. No. And there's a, there's a bit of a story. Like, I get on really well with Andy and did. We, we had a lot of fun. And he broke his, ra- his arm at an indoor race um, in England a month or so before the Commonwealth Games. So I was running in a cast. And after the race, we were under the thing and I was filthy. Um, my hands were shaking. I couldn't undo my, hand, my shoelaces to get my spikes off and everything. And Andy came up and he goes, oh. Mate, I fell as well, you know, and I said, I don't give a shit. I said, I I hope you broke the other arm on the fall. I feel so bad about saying it. And like, I look back at some of the things I said and did and I like shake my head and go, oh man. But in the heat of the moment, I, um, you know, I didn't really mind what was coming out of my mouth. I just kind of said it and then... Um, felt bad about it, but um, there's there's a few things that happened in and around that which were not my finest moments, but... um, Look, it was disappointing, obviously, and we'll never know is the answer mm, to that yeah. question, but I was in really good shape. I'd run 450 for 2K a few weeks earlier, and, you know... That's I, fucking booking it. <laughs> so that is that's, um, you yeah. know, and then to run 12.58 for 5K in the 5K a few days earlier, um, you know, I was fit, strong, ready to go, but the answer to that question is we never know. That's I mean, racing, never, eh? That's racing. It's true. We've... Uh, We've talked a lot about 2006, Com Games, Melbourne, very special. When you look back at your career as a whole, what are the are there any other races that really stand out to you personally? Yeah, well, the 2K when in Melbourne before pre Com Games when I ran 450 is probably one of the the better runs for me. I, I actually think my distance was probably 3K. I think I was really good at the 3K. Um, it's just not really that that frequently ran or raced. Um, the two mile at pre. Mm. which is the the, the, big, one. the, big, the big balls, balls. the big balls one um i felt that day and I, I i think the good races you don't really remember because you're sort of in in the zone and you finish the race and you can't really recall much about what happened mm-hmm. but i know from just you know rem- remembering that that race that it felt like a jog you know at four minute mile pace like i was just in that point in my career where everything just comes out easy um, so I, I think I could have run anything then. And I remember speaking actually to, um, Al, am I allowed to say Alberto Salazar? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, he, I spoke to him afterwards briefly because uh, everyone was having a laugh about the big balls thing. Um, and he, because I sort of was waving to the crowd in the last 50 and he goes, why didn't you run faster? You might have broken eight minutes. And I said, oh, eight, 803, eight minutes. What's it's not bad. Difference? I, won, <laughs> I, I, I won, like I was, you know, for me it was more um, winning yeah. and putting on a bit of a show and, you know, enjoying that, that part of it. Um, so I think that those two are probably um, my, the two best runs in terms of, you know, my memories and, and running fast. But competition-wise, Com Games is good. Helsinki, I can see it on Helsinki. your notes there. Um, 
was, was fantastic as well. Obviously, major major world championship medals hard to get, mm-hmm. um, and they're what people remember. So you know, in terms of the the and there's actually a race qualifying for my fourth Olympics at um, at Lakeside. I ran. 13, 17 or something like that in the rain and I'd come off three Achilles operations. Not many people probably real know about the back end of my career, but I had three Achilles operations and seven weeks after the third one ran 13, 17 to qualify for that. So um, no one actually would, would consider that um, one of my better runs, but for me personally, that there's the effort that that took yeah, to get there yeah. um, and overcome lots of challenges involved in that meant a lot. Can you imagine if you had Ultra G boost and like the super shoes? Yeah doing that stuff like that's the stuff where like your career gets prolonged so like, i think the shoes make a difference obviously i think they make more of a difference in your ability to back up yeah the recovery, mm-hmm. the recovery. Yeah. so yes the spikes might make you run a bit faster and everything else but the ability to train harder more frequently less stress in your body and then yeah. be active in your recovery and everything else is what's having the biggest improve or the biggest yeah. impact on performance i'm i'm very happy you brought up the uh the run at Lakeside to make your final Olympics because that was like that was to me that was when I was I wasn't really as into the sport when I was younger that was like prime when I was like fanboy mode so that was like in my eyes I was like kind of like the biggest one um and you just seeing you race against I can't remember who it was was it Collis Collis was second yeah and Ben Saint yep. yeah and, like, and I huge. you know we, we had a Ben and I get on really well that Collis I get on well with as well but there was a bit of tension around the you know everything at that point in time so to actually go and and like and I shove it where where it should have been shoved was was fantastic at that moment. Yeah. Um, so that meant a lot. And then actually I remember in the warm down Ryan Gregson came over and, and he's he's a legend as well of our sport and has done a lot of amazing things for for running in Australia. Came over and actually gave me a high five and said well done and he'd never spoken to me before. So you know little things yeah. like that That's awesome. um, make a big difference. There's yeah. so much emotion that yeah. that would have gone into that one. It's just so special. I also like how you you talked about how uh, like your distance being the 3K, because what I heard about you, like when I was younger, one of the things that we would say about you, or that you'll just hear, is that you could just run 60 second 400s forever. Yeah. That's, that was like the rumor. Joe would have loved training with you. <laughs> Joe Clark would have it's loved a, training with you. When it was going well, yes. It, it felt comfortable. If I could do it forever, I would have run 12.45 for, or 12.30 rather, for, yeah. for 5K. <laughs> but... Um, I never, funnily enough, never really attacked the 5K to see how fast I could run. It was always, every time I ran under 13 minutes was to race to win. Yeah. So I ran 12.55 against Gebra Celesi and tried to, to beat him there and took it on. Um, same thing against Bikili the next year, we ran 12.56 and then the Com Games we ran 12.58. It was always in competitions to try to win a race. I was never really that intent on running fast. Same with 8.03. Um, Tiriku Bikili, Kenanese's mm-hmm. little brother, took it out. So, you know, I was quite more of a competitor. I liked that part of it. Um, and so I was always spurred on to run quickly if the race was going that way. We did have one attempt to run a fast 5K in, Osa- uh, in Ostrava in 2007. Um, we ended up running 13.04. We had pace for 12.48, and I asked for that. And the pacemaker stepped on the rail after 50 metres and rolled his ankle and <laughs> got out of the way. So go. we jogged around, and I think we ran... Uh, 60.53 for the last 800 wow. and ran 13.04. Yeah, that's racing. That's racing. Do you have someone who was your biggest rival throughout your career? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know what? Because in Australia, you had no offense, like no one. Yeah, but you think that, but that adds expectation and pressure as well. You kind of feel more nervous and anxious racing in Australia because you probably shouldn't be beaten. True. Where yeah. when you go to Europe, and, I, and this is how I viewed my career, um, I was very competitive. The first question I ever got when I competed internationally, I ran 1999 World Junior Cross in um, Belfast, and I finished 17th. And I was the first white athlete, so I say that in inverted commas, first non-African athlete over the line. And I was hauled into this press room with all the media, and they said, oh, um, you know, what does it feel like to be the first non-African runner over the line? And I said, oh, pretty disappointing, actually. And they said, why? I said, well, I came 17th. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, that, like... Well, that, that's pretty good. I said, well, there's 16 other guys that were better. Like, that's how I, like, I was straight out of high school and yeah. no one had ever told me that, you know, it was Africa versus, you know, Af- you know it was always just a comp- competition to try to win. I feel like I'm hearing the big Mzungo in person right yeah. now. This is exactly, <laughs> the, um, you said, I wasn't told I, I was, well, was wasn't the quote? supposed to win. Exactly. But the, the reality is that was very, that was an interesting thing to learn because I could then remove the expectation or pressure 
when I would go and race over in Europe and I'd line up in a field of 15 and 14 were from Africa, again, from the big Mazunga. But no one really thought I was... No one was looking for me to try to win, so that was almost relaxing for me to be able to go in without that weight of expectation and actually just do my thing. And, um, you know, I enjoyed it. But the, I suppose the, the biggest question, the biggest answer to that question is who was your biggest... You are your biggest competition um, internally, there in your own mind. He's done it again. Um, He's done it again. You are. Um, and if you can get out of your own way, you'll, you'll be able to remove any limitations and barriers. Yes, you have other athletes that you want to beat and everything else, but that's motivation. Like that, that's something that you crave to, to want to prove a point to beat them. But at the end of the day, you've got to be able to psychologically in your own head release that in a competitor in whatever the circumstances are. Back to my original point, there's a moment in competition where um, you've got to decide. I'm all in here regardless of the outcome, or I'm going to opt out and then I'll have that excuse at the end of the race that maybe I could have given a bit more and you can walk off with a reason as to why you, you, know, you didn't necessarily get the result you wanted, where the brave ones, they just go all in and they deal with the outcome afterwards. 100%. Wish we bat was closer, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's ready to go. I will not be running with you guys tomorrow morning. <laughs> so at what, at what point in your career did you think coach, coaching is you know, something I might want to do? Well, um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I sort of transitioned out after the 2012 Olympics into doing some coaching um, in schools. So it was a natural progression for me with the company that we had to go into schools, high schools, and, and start coaching. And I was still running. I actually still tried to qualify for, um, what was the 2016 Rio Olympics yeah. in the marathon. I was unsuccessful um, in that, very unsuccessful. But I was still running. So I had a group that I was coaching but then training with and trying to sort of show them how to do it in person, I suppose. Um, and then that just naturally led into, um, you know, into a career in coaching. And I've been really fortunate as an athlete to have probably three really good coaches for really different reasons. Um, and my first coach was a guy called Bruce Scriven, who used to coach Lyndon Hall and has had some really good athletes, um, you know, throughout his time. Uh, and he taught me why I run, so why I love running and the enjoyment of running and everything else. And that was when I was younger. And then I had the Melbourne Track Club coach. Um, and he taught me about the high performance side of sport, you know, what, you know, what was required to be competitive internationally and, and to be a professional athlete and to be ruthless and all of those things. And I certainly don't regret that for a moment. That, that, wasn't, you know, that wasn't a time that was unsuccessful. But we together worked as a great team and had a lot of great success. And then the back end of my career, I had um, Chris Wardlaw, who was Steve Monaghetti's coach, Karen McCann's coach, um, to name a few. Um, and he taught me about being an independent athlete and... Um, a bit more about the, the styles of training, um, how to balance life, how to transition out of running and all of those sort of things. So through the three phases of my career, I've been really fortunate to have different lenses on coaching. So, you know, I, I sort of take a bit of each of them, I suppose, in terms of what, what I deliver to the group that, that I'm now working with, the, the OAC group um, down in Australia. And, but you've got to put your own spin on it. One of the, the biggest and toughest challenges as, a, as an athlete transitioning to coaching um, is remembering that it's not you out there competing anymore and actually removing yourself from the desire to want to do this or do that or I would have done that. That's not how it works. It's now trying to work in with what the athletes need for themselves and what's in their best interest. And you do make mistakes sometimes. Uh, and I spoke about this with, with Ben Buckingham, who's one of our athletes. He got beaten in the steeple Brisbane Track Classic before the Nationals. We, we wanted to try to break Sean Crichton's national record, 8.16, and had pace for it and everything. Um, and after three laps, the pacemaker got out of the way and then Ben got left on the front and um, Clarkey actually overran him in the last lap and he got beaten a week out from Nationals. And I went back and reflected on it and I thought, well, I approached that race like I would have done it. Like the pacemaker stepped out and I would have taken it on and just grinded Clarkey into the ground and run away with it. But that's not Ben's style of racing. He likes the competition. He likes to be involved in the tactics and then make a run from home at you know a bit closer to the end. So I learned a lot from that as a coach and actually sat with Ben and said, look, I'll take that because you know I, I ran it how I thought I should run it, not what was in your best interest. Mm -hmm. So we changed our strategy for nationals and ultimately he, he got the win. So as a, an athlete transitioning to coaching, you're gonna win some and you're gonna lose some, but you've, and learning to trust yourself as a coach is also different because it's not me out there doing the running. You've gotta you know, feel what you think is right and actually back that rather than reading all the stuff online or Talking to other coaches, yes, you've got to take bits and pieces, but you've also, I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing and good at what I'm doing because of me and my experiences, not because of what other people are doing, right? So that, that's really difficult. 
as well. But learning to get that confidence as a coach to, to believe in what you're doing is, um, you know, is, is a challenge. Dathan, I have no doubt, would have the same, you know, the same thing. Um, but it, I got some really good advice, actually, from a Michael Klim. Do you remember Michael Klim? Swimmer. Yeah. Mm. You would, yeah, a butterfly, butterfly. Yep. yeah, very good. Olympic medalist, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. He started this swimming school, Klim Swim in Australia, a very popular learning to swim school. And I said, oh, are you coaching in that? And he goes, no. I said, why not? And he said, well, really good swim coaches, uh, or so really good swimmers don't make good swim coaches. I said, oh, why is that? And he said, because um, they don't know what it's like to be afraid of the water. Mm. So when, when kids are learning to swim, they're terrified of getting in the water. And Olympic swimmers generally are just naturally good swimmers. They yeah. get in the water, they put their head under the water, they can swim, right? They're not afraid of the water. So how do you coach a kid that can't get in the water if you think it's just, just get in the water, it's easy, just swim. Mm-hmm. So I took that advice on board. And before I became the head coach of the OAC and before I started coaching you know, semi-professional athletes, I was coaching high school kids. I had to actually backpedal from being a professional athlete to going into school and working with young athletes and actually learning how to transition an athlete from not wanting to run or not being good at it to learning to love running, why they run, and then upskill them through their career to now where I've been doing that, well, 12, 11 years mm-hmm. I've been doing that to get to this point. I didn't just fall into the OAC job, and nor did Dathan. He did the same sort of pathway. So it's not something you go straight out of professional, well, very few do, go straight from professional running into professional coaching. There's a pathway that I think you should follow to upskill yourself to be better yeah well just hearing you talk today it is amazing because it is very clear or like everything that you talked about in terms of your different coaches you can really feel that you are the evolution like you've taken it all in and put your own spin on it and you are kind of the evolution and you can really clearly see how we progress in a sport as we learn and yeah people have all these amazing experiences and uh it makes me very excited to see you know just the future of the OEC Oceania and just yeah you as a coach and see where everything goes and uh yeah I mean honestly it's just been I think I speak for all of us it's just been amazing having you on and hearing all these great stories and just hearing you talk because you've experienced so much so much amazing things in this sport and you're incredibly wise so thank you very much for coming on the show uh before we wrap up is there anything else that you'd like to share absolutely not i'll look after my guys in in boulder for the next four weeks yeah we'll uh we'll take very good care of them but yeah from all of us thank you so much for coming on i think uh all the fans are gonna absolutely love this it's been very special to us so once again thank you thank you to everyone who listened uh we'll see all you guys next week